الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد uh, This is a very challenging topic uh, but it ties in nicely with something I said yesterday but even if you weren't here yesterday still the topic will make a lot of sense inshallah uh, Creating a culture and why do we need to talk about creating a family culture? Why not just talk about you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, the do's and the don'ts. Why just not that? Why not just, just give very practical, simple, uh, you know, recommendations? And that's how it works. Humans don't function as do and don'ts. Humans don't just take instructions. And that's why, if you look into Islam, you will find it's not just do and don't. Actually, at the very beginning of Islam, it started mainly with very little do's and don'ts, almost no do's and don'ts. It was mainly building a belief, a state of belief, building what we call the aqidah, what we believe in, what we hold on to dearly in our hearts. Because humans, the behavior of humans, the things that we do externally, are a mere reflection of what we believe in inside. So if we focus just on what we should do and what we shouldn't do, without changing the system, which is the software, if we don't change that, we won't be able to sustain these actions. We won't be able, and this is the reason why most people can't break through their, they can't break their bad habits. They can't build new good habits. The reason is they're working only on the actions. You might push yourself, use your willpower to do something you're not used to, or to stop doing something that you have built as a habit trying to stop it, trying to change it, you might be able to pull that off for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, but as soon as, we, as you let go, it's just like a spring that you have pulled from both sides, you've extended it, once you let go of it, it will go back to its original uh, shape. That's how humans behave. So the reason we're talking about culture is that culture is the philosophy or the soft system behind these actions, the good actions that we want to cultivate. And yesterday I talked about some of the things that parents should adopt and look into and investigate and maybe try to learn more about as to how we should deal with our kids in order to prepare them for a future that is really challenging. That is really challenging. We live in challenging times. And by the way, this statement has always been used throughout the ages. So every time is challenging. And our times are challenging. But it's just when people F uh, face new types of challenges, they think, oh, these challenges are just bigger than what we had because we became desensitized to the challenges we went through. So any generation, the, the, now the, the people that are in a position of parenthood, that are parents, people that are parents, you, in your youth, you went through challenges that were very difficult for your parents, that seemed to be surprising and overwhelming to your parents because they went through a different set of challenges and they think your challenges are bigger than theirs. And, and this is how the cycle goes on and on. So in order for us to adopt the right behaviors, we need to build a culture, a family culture. And a family culture is more of a philosophy. It's a set of beliefs. It's a whole system. It's a way of life that the family adopts collectively. And that's the difference. When we talk about the individual level, we talk about beliefs convictions, perceptions, and actions and habits. When we talk on, on an individual level, when we talk on a collective level, we call the same things culture. So culture is basically a set of beliefs, understandings, and attitudes, and actions. But when it's shared by a group of people, we call it culture. We call it culture. So how should the, or what are the main themes or the main components of uh, the family culture in Islam? the family culture of Islam. The main theme, the main theme is love. The main theme is love. And love is something that the Muslim scholars have talked a lot about, but in our times, it has not really been explored enough. It has not been utilized enough as it was in the old times. One of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, and also his student Ibn Al-Qayyim repeats the same statement in a couple of his books. And he says, the word love, or the concept of love, 
is at the heart of Islam. Is at the heart of Islam. And then he says, but the Quran usually doesn't refer to it as love. It doesn't use the word hub or mahabba in Arabic. But the Quran and the Sunnah use synonyms that are situational, that are suitable. So for example, love of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't usually call it love in the Quran or in the Sunnah. They usually refer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually refers to it as worship. As worship. And love for the parents. Usually the religious texts, the Quran and the Sunnah, refer to it not as love, but as birr. As birr. And the love the parents have for their kids. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to it not in the sense of love, not using the word love, but to put it in its right context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha an-nas wal hijara. O you who believe, protect yourselves and your families, that means your spouses, your children, and it could extend even to your parents, to your brothers and sisters, your siblings, etc. From a fire whose wood or whose, whose fuel is rocks and human beings. So Ibn Taymiyyah says, Allah doesn't refer to this as love, but Allah uses the word that is suitable for that context. Then Ibn Taymiyyah explains, he himself expounds, and he says, just to talk about the concept of love, because for, to many Muslims it seems to be a very alien concept. We talk about love, talking about love. Ibn Taymiyyah himself says about, he's, con he's connecting something, he's connecting what we call the Lordship of Allah, al rububiyyah to Al-Uluhiyyah. To the worship of Allah. He's connecting what we call Qada'ullahi uh, al to Qada'ullah al shari the decree or the command of Allah that is universal that has to do with the creation and the, the word of Allah and the legislation of Allah that has to do with what we should do as human beings, what we are supposed to do. So he connects all of these things together when he says everything in this universe is based and built on love. The force that underlies everything in this universe and the creation of Allah is the power of love. Then he says, لا يتحرك ساكن ولا يسكن متحرك في هذا الكون ولا ينزل مطر ولا تتحرك الرياح إلا بالمحبة. He says, there's nothing that stands still that starts moving and nothing in motion that comes to a standstill. No rain falls, no wind blows, except that the power behind it is love. Love of what? Love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love of Allah. And that's how the universe worships Allah. When the rain falls, it falls because it tries to please Allah. It is expressing its own love for Allah. This is how it lives. Everything in the universe loves Allah and moves by the love of Allah. Only humans and jinn are given the choice. Either to move by love of Allah or love of other things. So, now I'm not going to expand more on this, but I want to borrow this concept and take it into the family. Some people might say, oh you don't find in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, love your children. You don't find in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, love you know, your spouses. But there are things in the Arabic language, and this is generally the Arab, the Arab culture in the past, things that are obvious don't need to be stated. They don't need to be stated. Does anyone expect others to tell us to love our kids? You're not supposed to, no one's supposed to teach you that. No one's supposed to remind you of that. Because that's human nature. And that's exactly what the, uh, what the, uh, the prophets said to their people. When the Prophet said, came to their people and they said to them, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So their message was to worship Allah alone. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now the, their people had a different argument. They said, is Allah even there? So what was the response of the, of the Prophets? They said, afillahi shak, you're doubting Allah? It's so obvious that Allah is there. You're doubting this? 
So the fact that these people are doubting the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made no sense. Made no sense. It's completely against human nature. And it doesn't need to, no one needs to be taught that Allah is there. And I know some, some of you might have the question now, there are a lot of atheists, agnostics today, and they're doubting, there are millions of them that are doubting. Basically, these people grow, grew into that. They grew into that. The Prophet ﷺ said, كل مولود يولد على الفطرة. Each human being is born on a state of fitrah. And the scholars and the companions have explained what's the meaning of fitrah. Recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing Him and loving Him. That's what fitrah is. Everyone knows Allah is there. And this is why you know, some, some people in debates, they came up with this statement, which is true. They said there are no atheists in a crashing plane. Because once someone comes face to face with death, obviously all of these you know, false arguments that they entertain and all of this intellectual, false intellectuality will actually be removed and the only thing that will transpire or come to the surface is their true nature, which is knowing that Allah is there and He's in charge and He's the only one who can save them. So again, back to parenthood. So the family culture in Islam is supposed to be built on love. On love. And you don't need any kind of direct statement about this. Just look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The example of the Prophet. The Prophet Sallallahu for example, when his son uh, Ibrahim was born. His son Ibrahim was born. Uh, it was narrated in a couple of narrations that the Prophet Sallallahu would go every now and then. He would go home and he would hold Ibrahim in his hands and he would kiss him. And he would say, this is my son Ibrahim. So the Prophet ﷺ, how he dealt with his adopted son at the time, Zayd ibn Haritha. The Prophet ﷺ dealt with him with so much respect and love. How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his wives. How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his grandchildren. How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with the children of his own companions. There was so much love. One day the Prophet ﷺ was sitting among his companions and al Hussein comes about. The Prophet ﷺ holds him tight and he kisses him and he plays with him. So there is one of the companions who comes from the desert. He's a Bedouin, uh, Al-Aqra bin Habis. He says, صبيانكم? Do you kiss your children? You kiss your male children, your boys, you kiss them? Like he found that to be like inappropriate. The Prophet ﷺ looks at him and he says, Inna rahma. That's mercy. In another narration of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says to him, Wama amliku laka an naza rahmata min qalbik. What do I have to offer you if Allah has taken mercy away from your heart? Is this something to question even? That you should show love and compassion to your children? So the first and most important pillar in the family culture in Islam is love. And love has a healing power has a healing power. And I know, I know that parents love their children. But oftentimes, there are impurities that blemish that love or that hold it back. Thinking we have to be on top of our children with everything. Thinking that our children cannot make a mistake. Thinking our children cannot make a mistake. From a young age, if the child makes a mistake, it's a disaster. So we say, I'm disciplining the child, I'm being harsh against the child, I'm being critical of the child because I love him or because I love her. I don't question the fact that you love them. I don't question that. But the child, if you keep treating the child that way, the child will grow to question this. He or she will grow to question this. And if they question it, what will happen because humans live on love. Humans need love. They need affection. They need acceptance from people around them. They need this kind of relatedness, this authenticity and this trust in, the, in very close relationships. Once you hold it back by means of discipline, by means of being harsh, by means of being critical to your child, you jeopardize or you risk losing your child. Why? Because the child will start questioning whether you will love them or not. And you can actually hear a child when one of their parents disciplines them, they say, I don't think my mom loves me. I don't think my dad really loves me. I think he hates me. You'll find the child saying this and they say, oh, it's just a child. No, five minutes later, they'll change. Right, they will change. But this stain will stay in their hearts. And if they accumulate, they will come to a point where, as I said yesterday, they will 
hold back their trust from their parents and they will start questioning that love and it becomes a permanent state and the children will start to look for love, for trust, for listening ear outside of the house, outside of the house. And that's when your influence over your child is diminished or at least minimized. And that's the main point that we have to understand. So the first and foremost element within the culture of a family building is, 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 is love. And as I said, we all have love, but what should we do? We should make love apparent in the family. So I'm not going to keep this as a theory. I don't want to keep it as a theory. Let's do it practical. <clears throat> Every day in the morning, again in the morning, because this is the time when your mind and heart are fresh. Remind yourself that these children of mine are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't own them. I don't possess them. Allah has given them, them to me as a trust in order to cultivate them, to prepare them for life, to tell them about Allah and educate them and prepare them. And all I have to do is give them my unconditional love and give them everything I can in order to prepare them for life and show them the way that leads to paradise. But I'm going to love them no matter what. And I will make this love apparent. I will make it apparent. Even when I'm upset, I will still acknowledge that love and let them know it. Even when I discipline them, I will discipline my child, but I will tell my child at that time, from my heart, not just lip service, how much I love them. For some, this might sound like impractical. Try it out and see for yourself. I personally have used this. And I know people who have used this advice and it works like magic. There's nothing that changes human beings more than love. And there is nothing more powerful in the life of a child and when I say a child, I'm saying up to 15 and 16 years old and sometimes even adults, more than the love of their parents. A lot of us grew up under parents who were probably critical and harsh and maybe they would not show their emotions. But when we, probably we were as well like completely unpleased with that. And we didn't like the fact that we did not have enough love and emotion from our parents. But when you have children and you grow up, if your parents are alive, you go and kiss their feet. And you wish that you really acknowledge their contribution and their silent love, and their silent love when, at the time when you did not recognize it. And those who don't have their parents anymore, they wish their parents come back so they can express their gratitude and their thanks to their parents. So we know this as human beings. Love, even we adults, we crave that love. So with the children, we need to give them that love. And in order to make it practical, as I said, you need to make it a point. You need to bring it to what we call in Arabic, Al-Quwwatu Al-Wa'iyah. Al-Quwwatu Al-Wa'iyah. That's our awareness. You need to bring it to your awareness and make it a point that I am going to communicate that love that Allah put in my heart towards my son, towards my daughter, no matter what happens, no matter how they behave. Even if I discipline them, even if I punish them, I will still make the point of love apparent and clear. And you will be surprised that even your discipline and your punishments will actually pay off. They will pay off. Because once you, once you punish with love, once you criticize with love, once you discipline with love, the child will realize that you care for them. But if you, do it, if you do it with vengeance, if you do it with anger and hatred, the child will get the wrong message. The child will get the wrong message. The Prophet ﷺ always, you know, often criticized people who made mistakes. That's al-amr bil ma'ruf wa al munkar. But he did that in a loving fashion. He, led, he did it in a compassionate fashion. And this is why it had an impact. So the first and most important concept of or element in this culture, the family culture in Islam is the concept of love. And speaking from experience and a lot of observation and you can look around. People who show and express their love, their genuine love to their kids 
even if they are not practicing, even if they are not practicing, usually they maintain a friendship. They maintain a friendship with their kids even into adulthood. And the kids of those people, even though these families are not even religious, and probably the parents even don't pray, and they get involved in a lot of the things that non-Muslims get involved in, a lot of these kids, they don't fall into serious things like drugs, like women, like crime, and sometimes maybe a faith crisis. Still these people are on the borders of Islam, but they don't leave Islam. So the first element is love. The second element, and inshallah I will pull these elements together to show you how they play out together. The second element is respect. Is respect. And I said yesterday, and it's a very important point, that oftentimes we think our children are our property. They are not. They are not. They are a trust that is given to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so once you see that they belong to Allah, they don't belong to you, but you were entrusted to bring them up, you were entrusted to cultivate them and educate them and help them grow in a healthy way, then you would actually count to 1,000 before you disrespect them. We often f feel it's our rights to disrespect our children if they do something wrong. You have no right. You have no right. The Prophet ﷺ even says in the hadith, كُلُّ الْمُسْلِمِ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِ حَرَامِ دَمُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعِرْضُهُ The Muslim is sanctified. He's protected in Islam. He's haram for you to violate. دَمُهُ His life, his blood, his life. وَمَالُهُ His property and his possessions. وَعِرْضُهُ And his dignity and his honor. It's haram for you. How sometimes do we make this kind of subconscious exclusion and we get our children out of it? Because if you humiliate your own child, it will be easy for others to humiliate, humiliate him or her. And if the child gets used to being humiliated in the house, it will be easy for them to be humiliated and accept humiliation outside of the house. So this, this is another important element in the culture, it's respect. You respect your child, your child should respect you. It should be a culture of respect. It should be a culture of respect. And the ones who set the pace for respect are the parents. Are the parents. Now if the child learns something from outside and they disrespect their parents, they should be disciplined. They should be reminded. But again, with love. And again, with respect. With respect. And this is very difficult, by the way for domineering, dominating parents who've always, who've been brought up even like most of us in cultures where there's a lot of dominance of the father or the mother and the child is completely has like, everything the child is violated by the parents. Why? To bring up the child. And as I said, maybe in some environments that works. But we have to face it that in our times it might still work with some people for the, but for the most part it doesn't work. It doesn't work, it will backfire because the child has exposure to other options in life, to other examples, other people who are experiencing freedom and respect and love in their lives and, and these people seem to be growing. So this is the second element, it's respect, respect. The third element is husnul dhan, husnul dhan, which means good suspicion, good thoughts. And this is something very common, something very common among almost everyone, every family, Muslims, non-Muslims. When the child does something wrong, we misinterpret the, in, the intention of the child. The child, maybe sometimes, they might talk back to you. You think the child is being disrespectful. You think the child is being disrespectful. Or the child sometimes might make some trouble, you try to discipline them, you tell them off, and they don't respond. And they feel stuck, they feel stuck, you might even like corner them and tell them to do what you want them to do. And they can't get themselves to do it. Sometimes the child gets excited and they become very hyperactive 
and they make a lot of trouble and they can't, can't hold themselves back. You want to subdue them, you corner them, you scream at them, you tell them off, you threaten them, and the child is getting even worse. They get out of control, they can't even control themselves. And what happens? They become even more annoying to you. And you are more likely now to punish them and maybe humiliate them and disrespect them. Oftentimes, this escalation happens because we have su'udhan in our children. We have the evil suspicion. We always arrive at a conclusion that the child is doing this because they want to tease me. The child sometimes makes some noise. They're just playing. But you take it personal. They might talk back to you just because they don't feel good. They feel upset at that moment. They happen to feel upset and they responded to you. This is, by the way, a lot of the cases where we arrive at a conclusion that the child is doing this to defy me, to upset me, to tease me, he's challenging me, he's doing this, they're actually doing it innocently, innocently. So one of the most powerful elements of a family culture, and this can help you a lot, and I've personally have seen this work out in so many examples. If the child makes something wrong, have a conversation with them. Children don't understand their emotions. They're acting emotional or they're being upset and they're causing you so much trouble. Speak with them. Initiate a conversation and tell them, why do you feel you need to do this? Why do you feel you need to do this? They will tell you at the beginning, I don't know. I just feel like it. But if you ask them again and keep asking them and help them understand where their feelings and their, where their temptations are coming from, you will figure out that actually it comes from a good place. Children are innocent and even lying. That's a very good example, lying. Oftentimes, you'll see the child doing something. What are you doing? And they will actually, just because of your manner of asking and maybe your general demeanor with the child, you usually come about across as very threatening and authoritative. The child is scared. Even though they're doing something good, they will lie. They will lie. For you, Okay, you see through the lie, you're going to punish them for the lie. And they will feel bad, and you will feel bad. What happens? They will lie again. And again, and again, and again. And what happens? You're shaping a self-image within them that they are liars. I caught you lying. You lied yesterday. You always lie. And we think we're being smart. But what happens? You are telling the child, you are a liar. I know you. Because the child trusts you. They trust your judgment. They know that you know they don't know. So you tell the child, oh, you're a liar. Oh, you always lie. What happens now, they're going to take this as an image. They will take it to heart. And they will actually become liars. Usually when the child starts lying, they're doing this to protect themselves. Protect themselves from your temper, from your anger. Protect themselves from being caught. Maybe they did something wrong, right? But they realize they will be caught. They will be in trouble. So what they do, they think of a way to escape. They think of a way to get away, you know, to get away with what, were they, what they did. So they realize lying works. So they start to tell you lies. So if you, can, if you see through the lie, if you see through the lie, what you need to do is actually see what the child is trying to cover. What the child is trying to hide away from you. If the child makes a mistake, usually ask them, initiate a conversation. If you express your love and your respect to the child and tell them, listen, we're going to speak as two human beings and I will help you out all the way through. But I need you to tell me why, for, for example, why did you hit your sister? Why did it take someone else's you know, pro pen or pencil? Why did you take that? Why did you take the to your, to your brother's toy? Why did you do that? Oftentimes, it's not that the child, for example, if they took someone else's toy, it's not because they want, they actually, they are thieves. It's not because they want to steal. Often, oftentimes, children don't understand, they don't see, they don't, they don't understand what it means to own something. They don't understand someone else's property cannot be violated. They don't understand, they don't see this. Their minds have not grown yet. But when we accuse them, oh, you, you, are, you are a thief. You stole someone's property. That's not for you. It's haram. But if you ask the child, why did you take that? Oftentimes you will find the child says, 
I saw that they have a toy and I wish I have a toy. So in their small mind, they figured out a way, if they take that toy, they would have a toy. They just had a very strong feeling to own something as a child. So usually when we interpret their actions favorably, in a positive sense, we actually uh, cancel out a great possibility of our children going downhill when it comes to a lot of the bad habits. So every time your child makes a mistake, your child makes a mistake, try to see through it. Initiate a conversation. Make them feel safe that I, wa I want to help you out and I know that you've done this with good intention. Let's find out exactly what you wanted to do and let's find out what we can fix together. And you will be surprised that slowly, slowly the child will regain their trust in you and you will be surprised how good children are in terms of intention. Children always, take it as a rule, children always come from a good standpoint, regardless of what they do. If they lie, if they smack their little brother or sister, if they do whatever they do, they're doing this in good faith. And they're doing it for a good reason. But they went wrong. They chose the wrong means and the wrong action to execute or to fulfill that good intention. And that's what we need to understand. So again, the elements of a healthy or a, a healthy family culture in Islam is first unconditional love to the child. You cannot hold back your love from the child because this is the oxygen of their life. This is the oxygen of their personality, of their emotional safety and stability. Number two is respect. Number three is good suspicion. Always arrive at good conclusions. They come from a good standing point. They always, everything the children do, they do it for a good reason. But somewhere down the line, they went wrong. The third element of a healthy family culture is to use less commands and less authority and resort to the power of suggestion. Power of suggestion. A lot of the temptations that you find inside, uh, you find outside the house and people fall into drugs, women, sometimes uh, agnosticism and doubting faith or some other maybe sexual orientation none of them the child or the teenager decides to get involved in them because of commands from authority there is no government in the world that says become a homosexual there's no government in the world that says go and drink alcohol there's no government in the world that says smoke weed there's no government in the world that says go and commit fornication there is no school principal that uh, forces the children or the pupils to go and commit any of these things. None of these things happen by means of authority, but they happen by way of suggestion. By way of suggestion. Oftentimes we want our children to be the best, so we want to force them into what is good. But this is not how the hum how human brain works. Humans love to choose, and that's the concept of choice. So when you want your child to do something, use the power of suggestion. And this is a very successful technique when it comes to uh, raising your kids. You want them to learn Quran, do you know what to do? Take them to a Quran competition. Get them introduced to uh, a Quran class where there are students or ch children around the same age who have memorized a lot of Quran and they have a beautiful recitation. Yesterday, just yesterday, one of our brothers told me that he had an interest into how children learn and so on and so forth. And he looked into something about how the Jewish community in Canada and elsewhere, how they manage to motivate their children. How they manage to motivate their children. They actually make it a point, they make it a point through some of their uh, institutions, social institutions, sometimes by means of their own private schools or by means of their religious institutions to actually visit top-ranking universities. They take their children around age 
8, 9, 10, up until 15. They go and visit Harvard uh, University, Yale University, Toronto University. And they go and speak with specialists and experts in their field, people on top of their game. And they get sometimes, they make events where they bring people who are experts in their fields. And they talk in a very passionate way about what they do. Whether it's science, whether it's medicine, whether it's engineering, architecture, uh, online marketing, anything. So they expose them to a lot of these great examples and that's the power of suggestion. So the child, as they see these great examples, they get motivated. And they become more success oriented. And they develop a personal goal, I want to be like this man. I want to be like this man. So that's the power of suggestion. So instead of you forcing the child, thinking, thinking how, this is how the child works, that you force him or force her and they will completely respond to what you say. It doesn't work like this. So use the power of suggestion. Give the child offers. Give the child offers. As I said, like take them to a Quran competition. Once they see these children, how they compete and how much work they have put in and how much you know, beautiful their recitation is and this, these great like, examples and achievements, they will be inspired. You don't have to tell them, listen, you have to go to Quran school. You have to learn Quran. You have to memorize this. No, they will tell you, I want to memorize. I want to learn. And so on and so forth. So use the power of suggestion in the family and minimize the use of direct commands. Because direct commands give the child or the teenager the impression that I'm in control, you have to do what I want. And humans don't like this. And look at a lot of the media. How does the media influence people? It doesn't tell them what to believe. It just gives them suggestions, offers them examples, and people swallow that easily. Because once you come across very direct, very confrontational, what happens, you create resistance. You create res How often you tell your child, go to bed? Go to bed. They don't want to go to bed. The other day there was uh, uh, a mother, a Muslim mother, she was trying to teach her uh, child the letters. And the child doesn't want to learn letters. It says, this is Alif. Alif is, for example, uh, what's Arnab? Alifun Arnab. Okay, this letter is for the word Arnab. Alifun Arnab. The child, like day in and day out, for a few days, the child refuses to learn. Like, okay, Alifun Arnab, but he doesn't learn, he doesn't pick up. So she figured out his most favorite toy that he plays with most of the time. He likes it so much, he sleeps with the toy next to him. She says, okay. Something like popped up in her mind and she said, maybe this will work out. So she said, okay, we're gonna teach your, uh, your toy, which is a trooper, yeah? We're gonna teach trooper the letters. Come trooper. This is Alif. Alif is for Arnab. And he's watching with amazement. With amazement. For about half an hour, she taught the tro trooper uh, the three or four letters with the words. Later on, she hears the child by himself. Later on, he says, Alifun Arnab, Ba'un Batta. He has learned what his toy learned or was supposed to learn. That's the power of suggestion. You don't do it directly. So the child was able and he was even writing down the letters. That's the power of suggestion. So oftentimes, we think this is what we tell our child how to be, how to behave, and how, what they should do. We think we are, they are supposed to respond. We make it hard for them. We make it hard for them. There's a story about uh, Umar ibn Khattab عنه, that a man came to him and complained about his son. His son was old. He was like uh, an adult. But his son wasn't treating him well. So the man complained about his son Umar ibn Khattab was the Khalifa, he wanted the son to come over, so he sent someone to bring the son. The son came and he said, your father is complaining about you. So the son said certain things about his father, what his father did not do for him when he was young. Like he did not educate him, he did not treat him he, uh, well, he did not uh, uh, like cultivate him and teach him and so on and so forth. So Umar al-Khattab turned to the father and he said to him a very powerful word in Arabic. He said, 
He said, you made uquq to your son before he makes uquq to you. You mistreated him before he mistreats you. So what do you expect? And this is where there's another statement from Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu as well, where he says, أَعِينُوا أَبْنَاءَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بِرِّكُمْ Help, you know, facilitate for your children that they are dutiful and good to you. How do you facilitate that? Use the easiest mean for them. So if they do not like confrontation, don't use it. Don't use it. Use something else. Don't try to get them to pray at gunpoint. Like you have to pray now. But if you take the child to a good environment where the children do pray and they pray from their heart, the child will slowly pick up and learn. If the child sees you as a parent, that you pray and the mother prays, and when you pray it has an impact on you, that you enjoy it, that you love the prayer, and that you look forward to the time of the prayer. You don't have to tell your child to pray. You'll find the child standing next to you, and every time you pray, they want to pray. If the child loves you and they say, see you pray, they want to pray with you. If sometimes, and this is an advice for the brothers, if you're at home, you know, sometimes make jama'ah with your wife. Don't pray by yourself as she prays by herself. Pray with your wife. You get the, you get the reward of jama'ah 27 times. That's jama'ah, even if it's only you and your wife. So pray when the, when the children see the parents pray together at home and they see the respect and they see that the parents enjoy the prayer and they love it, you will find that the children would Look up, to the prayer, look up to the parents and they want to do the prayer. They want to, be, they want to emulate their parents. They want to be like that. They want to see this example and they want to implement it themselves. So use this suggestive power. And generally speaking, look, look at the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. A lot of the actions of the Prophet wasallam were reported by means of example. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say, do this, don't do that. There are things that he, where he said that, where it needed to be stated. But a lot of the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ, specifically about ibadah, was what? A description from the companions. They saw how he prayed and they reported the prayer. Like in the Salah, the biggest number of hadith that tell us how to pray are not from the Prophet ﷺ saying do this and do that. Except for the person who wasn't praying well, the Prophet ﷺ needed to teach him. But most of the hadith on Salah, they're just a description of how the Prophet ﷺ prayed. When the children see that when you eat, you, t you eat your breakfast, you really say, thank you, Allah. You, f you just say, alhamdulillah, alladhi razaqani hadha, uh, wa at'amanihi min ghayri hawlim minni wa laquwa. All praise is due to Allah who has given, who has fed me this without any power from me. If the child sees that you do this and you always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you always thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is always present in your life, you don't have to teach your child so much about Allah. They already know it. They already know it. And if you look at children, they're just a copy of, their, of one of their parents or both of them. This is why we say, like father, like son. It's a chip of the old block. This is, how, this is how it works. The children pick up so much that even the child even picks up the way the father or the mother walks. Oftentimes, look at a child and a father, you see that they walk the same, a father and a son, they, most of the time, they walk the same way. You might say it's genetics, no, but it's far beyond the percentage that genetics gives. There's a lot. If you see sometimes a habit of a father, sometimes like a father has a habit of maybe scratching the back of their head, you'll find the son, the son de developing the same thing. There's a word the father says, you'll find the son saying the same thing. The same with the daughter and the mother. So when we create this kind of positive culture that's based on love, that's based on respect, and that's based on uh, good suspicion, or basically interpreting the intention of the child in a very favorable and positive way. This will build a very beautiful environment for the child. It's a safe environment. And this will help the child, as I said, trust their parents. And when they get enough love, enough, res enough respect, and enough trust of their intentions at home, I'm telling you, Children, when they go out of the house, they can't wait for the time they're going to go back home. Because they have people who understand them at home. People that they can relate to. People who truly love them. People who they can count on. Who wants, to, who, you know, who wants someone else when they have such love at home? 
So this is the kind of culture that, that we want to build uh, within uh, a Muslim family. And there is something very important here. It's, it's, it's more of an extension of that culture, but I find this very important. We need to build for our children a congruent narrative. What does that mean? A congruent narrative. We usually tell the child, if you don't listen to, like the mother tells the child, if you don't listen to me, if you disobey me, Allah will destroy you. You will not pass the exams. Or if you do not pray the five daily prayers, nothing will work out for you. What happens? Okay, it seems to work maybe when the child is young. But when the child sees other people who don't pray, they're not good with their parents, and these people have it all. What will happen to the child? Confusion. Confusion. A lot of the children, they grow up under the impression that if you, don't, if you do this, if you don't do that, if you don't do as I tell you, what will happen, you will not have a successful life, and Allah will cause everything to like shut down in your face, and it will, you know, you will have all trouble and so on and so forth. For example, they go to university, they see the people who do everything that is haram, everything that's wrong, and they're having it all. So our, sometimes these advice or these words that we give to our children will be a source of fitna for them. Why? So we need to build a congruent narrative. A congruent narrative of Islam that does not go face to face with the reality, the actual reality where people live in, or the, our children are going to see on a daily basis. Because when we strip Islam down, to, the uh, to, to a level where we tell the child, if you disobey me, Allah will cause you to fail the exam. That's not what Islam tells us. Because you could do all the bad things in this life and still Allah gives you, right? That's what the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُمْلِي لِلظَّالِمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if there's someone who is an oppressor, someone who does wrong, Allah is going to give them. Allah will give them. Why? In order for them to reach the climax of their oppression, to do everything in their potential of that kind of uh, injustice. And then Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them out, that's the end of them. So when we make a, a, a narrative about Islam and about how things work out when it comes to Islam, we need to be careful. We need to be careful. Oftentimes we say to the child, and this is something that's a little bit different, but it's, it's relevant. We say, if you don't listen to me, if you don't obey me, Allah will put you in the hellfire. There's a lot of the scholars of Islam who say you shouldn't tell the child, you shouldn't scare the child using the hellfire. You shouldn't. Because you're giving them the impression that Allah is lying in wait, Allah is just there for them, and He wants them to make a mistake, so He takes them out and throw them, throws them in the hellfire. So don't use, because oftentimes we use this, why? Because we want to manipulate the child. We want to control the child. You do what I tell you, or you go into the hellfire. Or Allah will punish you. What kind of impression are we giving our kids? It's very dangerous. So we need to build a congruent narrative, a proper understanding of Islam, that what happens in this life, we should not make a judgment if we don't know. Like if you, for example, don't listen to your father, if you don't study the subject that your father wants you, or the major that your father wants you to study, you know, you will not succeed in life. Allah will not cause you to succeed. But they will see other people who've done whatever they wanted, and these people are successful. So what happens then? They will start questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They start questioning whether actually what you're telling them about Islam is even true or not. Because they see a reality, a solid fact, in, in front of them that seems to contradict and smash completely what you told them. And if it happens a couple of times, they'll start questioning what you tell them. Questioning what you tell them. So this again, let's try to put these elements together. Yes. 
first of all, the most important thing is the culture has to be based on love. On love, unconditional love. And we said love is a fitrah. So no one needs to push you to it. But you just need to make it apparent and clear to your child that you truly love them and value them. That's number one. Number two is a culture of respect. A culture of respect. Looking at the, how the Prophet ﷺ treated Al Hassan and Al Hussein, you would think, wow, these guys, they were so lucky. They were so lucky because the only thing that you can see in these narrations is mercy, love, and respect. Mercy, love, and respect. As if these, these two children, who are just two, three years old, as if they are so precious. And they were indeed so precious. The third element is we said having husnul dhan. Husnul dhan in the child. The child makes a mistake, don't misinterpret their intentions. They must be coming from a good place within themselves. But you just need to find out. And you need to help them find out. And I'm going to Then the fourth thing that we said was basically to build a, a coherent or congruent narrative about what we tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we tell them about the truth and about justice. So that whatever they see in this life does not go in direct conflict to what we tell them. Otherwise, they will start questioning everything we told them. The thing that I will close with, and this is a very important thing, and this is an experiment. And some people might say, uh, you know, when you read the books of the scholars of Islam, you will find them establishing evidence at the beginning. So they will say, and the evidence for this, Usually these four things. They will say, this thing is known by logic. Logically, it's known. It makes sense. Everyone knows it, recognizes it. Like, uh, two is more than one. That's logical, yeah? You don't need to prove it to anyone. So it's known. بالعقل. And بالنقل, which is revelation. Or بالسماع. الآيات المسموعة. The, uh, the revelation. Quran or Sunnah. Uh, something that has been proven in, a, in the Quran and Sunnah. For example, like لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظُّ الْأُنْثَيَنِ Brothers and sisters in inheritance, the brother gets double the share of the sister. وَبِالْفِطْرَةِ And this is something that humans recognize by fitra. And there's another dalil, another proof. And the fourth as well is مَعْلُومٌ بِالتَّجْرِبَةِ This is something that is known with experimentation. People try it out, this is how it plays out. For example, some of these they mention مَعْلُومٌ بِالتَّجْرِبَةِ أَوْ بِالْحِسِّ they say that the fire burns. What's the proof that the fire burns? <laughs> is the re actual reality. When you put your finger in, in the fire, it will, it will burn it. It burns. That's a tajriba. Sometimes you will learn something from experience. Either your own experience or the experience of someone else. And when you bring it in and you use it, there are some Muslims who have a problem in their heads, in their minds. That when you come up, use something that has been proven by experience or by science, proper science. I'm not talking about philosophical aspects of science. I'm talking about real experimental science. And you mention it, they say, oh, this is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. This is not mentioned. This is not from Islam. We don't need to listen to this. We don't need to take this. Sometimes you come up with something people will say, oh, no, 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 this is psychology. We don't learn from that. This shows this person has a problem in their heads and maybe in their hearts as well. And maybe in their hearts. The Prophet ﷺ took a lot of like experiments, a lot of lessons from people who are non-Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ took some certain plans for war from non-Muslims. Why? Because they were experimented and they were tested and they survived those tests. The Prophet ﷺ took that as experience, collective experience of humanity. The wisdom or lessons are the lost property of a believer. Wherever he finds it, he is more deserving. He's most deserving of it. So sometimes there are things that happen. And by the way, 
Like I came across, and this is a very beautiful example, the teacher of Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen, who's uh, uh, Shaykh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'di, Rahimahullah. One of his most popular books is, uh, is the book that actually we're explaining you, uh, on the Friday halaqa, the Jum'ah halaqa, which is Al-Wasa'il Mufida lil Hayat al saida the beneficial or useful means to a happy and tranquil life. So, guess what's the story behind this book? Where did it come from? This book, the Shaykh wrote it or started writing it when he was in Lebanon, when he was being treated for hypertension. He had high blood pressure. So he was being treated. And when he was treated, the doctors told him not to spend so much time, you know, working hard, basically reading and writing. So he decided to take a break. His son was there. His son went to the, some of the bookshops and he found a book. And the book is written by, it was a bestseller at the time. These were, by the way, 1940s. 1940s. So the book was the bestseller of Dale Carnegie, Stop Worrying and Start Living. It was a bestseller at the time. So it was also translated into Arabic. So his son bought it. And he gifted it to his father. The father read the book and he liked it. He fell in love with it. He fell in love with the book. So he read the book and he said, Inna hadha rajulun aqil. He said, this is a man of reason. He said about Dale Carnegie, this is a man of reason. Then he took his book and he, he took the book and he gifted it to a friend who was go, going through some emotional hardships. He said, read this, it will help you out. Then the Shaykh said to his son, go and buy me two copies of the same book. So he bought him two copies and it was time to go back to Saudi Arabia, to, uh, uh, to Al Qasim, to go back home. So he went back home, had the two copies. Shaykh kept a copy for himself in his own library. And the Shaykh at the time was probably the first one in Saudi Arabia to build a public library from his own finances. So he built a public library for people for access of the public. And he made a point to keep that book in that public library so people could refer to it. And his son says, every time someone had some emotional hard times or psychological issues, the Sheikh would tell them to go and borrow the book from the library and read it. Okay, so now this is just uh, to pave the way to what I'm gonna say. What I'm gonna say, because some people had this issue of, okay, you what you're talking is about psychology. Allah SWT says in the Quran, ما فرطنا في الكتاب من شيء. We have left nothing except that we talked about it or we made a mention of it in the book, which is in the Quran. Although the scholars dispute the meaning of this, they say the book here doesn't necessarily refer to the Quran, but refers to al al-Mahfuz. But even those who said that it refers to Al-Quran, it doesn't say that Islam mentions everything about every detail, but it gives you the doorways to knowledge. The doorways to knowledge. This is why one, one of our contemporary uh, da'iyas was asked by a non-Muslim. He said the Quran, oh, the Quran says about itself that it talks about everything. How does it tell you how to make biryani? He said, well it does tell us how to make biryani. He says, but I read the Quran cover to cover. It doesn't say anything about biryani or any other dish for that matter. He said, no, the Quran says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge the experts in the field, if you don't know. So you want to know how to make biryani, ask you know, good cooks, chefs, who know how to make biryani, they'll tell you how to make biryani. That's what the Quran tells us. So this, we need to understand what, how, you know, some, sometimes we don't, and this is what the scholars call in Arabic, an-naz'ah. Some people are not good at taking the ruling from the evidence or the meaning, so they take it mutilated and distorted. So the scholars usually describe some of the, like the best usulis usually were described كَانَ يُحْسِنُ النَّزْعَ مِنَ النُّصُوصِ He knew how to take meanings and rulings from the text. Very skillful in that. Okay, now the story was an experiment that took, that happened in 1968. And it's a famous experiment that was uh, made at a wide scale and it's very important in parenting, at a wide scale. And it was made by a scientist, a psychologist, who was called Rosenthal. Rosenthal, at the time, with another one. And basically what they did, they went to schools, elementary schools, and they claimed that they had, uh, or that they have uh, managed to devise, or put together, uh, an intelligence test that could predict the performance of the children in the school. And it was very accurate. So they trained the teachers. 
They trained the teachers. They let these students sit for, uh, sit for the test. They went through the test and they trained the teachers. They said the ones who are going to come on top or score the most on this test, in this test, they actually, by the end of the year, they will be the first in the class. They will come first in class. So they actually did that. So the students went through the test and the names of the top students were only disclosed to the teachers. And the teachers were instructed not to change their style of teaching, not to give any extra attention to any students, keep maintain their own styles. Du during the year, the, the, the teachers were checked upon, were checked upon for their style of teaching and everything. Towards the end of the year, the results proven right. The children who scored the highest in the test, they came first in class. This seems to make sense, except one missing piece of information. The test was not an intelligence test. It was a completely random test. It had nothing to do with intelligence and would not predict anything. What's the point? When the teachers realize that, for example, in this class, Muhammad and Khadija scored the highest, they will be first. The expectations of the teachers turned out to be real. They changed the behavior of the kids. This experiment was replicated over and over again because that was mind-blowing. We're talking about if a teacher expects a child to come first, they will come first. Sounds like magic, right? This is a scientific theory that has been experimented, has been tested rigorously. So like means scholars have tried to challenge it and prove it wrong, and they only managed to prove it right. And it's called uh, the Pygmalion effect. It's, it's very well established now in psychology, and they use it in marketing. The Pygmalion effect. They call it the prophecy that fulfills itself. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecy. What does that mean? That means expectations. Your expectations of your child will affect how they behave. And that point ties in very nicely with what I said about having husnuddan. Having husnuddan. Time out. Sure. Okay. Husnuddan. <coughs> And this is why I said you need to develop a culture of husn al When you have husn al in the child, have good expectations of the child, you will be surprised that the child will change. The child will change. If they misbehave, don't see it like the child is bad and intends bad. No. See it as the child intends good. The child intends good. And if you see it that way, you will change and the child will change. And Something related to this was mentioned in the Qur'an as well. Not exactly, but an element of it was mentioned in the Qur'an, and I referred to it yesterday. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Fussilat, إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ السَّيِّئَةِ Repel the evil with good. Respond to evil that comes to you with good. People are aggressive, people are hateful towards you, respond with love, with respect, with forgiveness. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ Lo and behold, the one with whom you have, there is enmity between you and him, they will turn into a very close and intimate friend. Only the ones that are patient, that are persistent and who persevere in this, those are the ones who will get it and the ones who are given tawfiq by Allah. So your expectations of other people will usually play out to be true. So be careful about what to expect from your children. Expect good and you will see much more goodness coming from them. Expect bad from them and bad intentions, that's what you're going to get more of them. Be more suspicious of your kids, thinking you're being smart. I caught them in the act. I caught them guilty. You think that's being smart? That's actually making them even worse. Try to catch them doing good things and reward them for that. And you will see that this will actually grow. This will actually grow. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us uh, develop a very positive culture, family within our families that will empower our children and make them more steadfast and more resilient and immune to all of these waves of influence and, 
and attempt to change their mind and maybe challenge their faith, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them strong in that and to help us play a major role in helping them out. Jazakumullah khair for your attention. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.